Hello, I'm Rob Hirschfeld, CEO and co-founder of RackN, and this session, the third, is about the uh, SaaS model, the subscription economy that we've been building up together that really has profound changes in ownership and innovation and R&D and, and who owns the, the technologies and the, the sources of innovation uh, that we have going forward. And this is the place where we start to tackle those big topics. It's really pivotal to the whole discussion. Uh, and it keeps coming up in everything we talk about, you know, cloud economics and data economics and things like that. So keep your ears out. Uh, this is a really important subject and one that we come back to over and over again in the ongoing Cloud 2030 discussion. So if something uh, catches your eye here, we're, it's going to come back up again. This is one of our big topics. Enjoy. Where we are is really right at the edge of one of the topics that was very activating throughout our conversations, which is the subscription model for technology development, right? The sassification of every uh, and of 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 our delivery mechanisms for technology, and and what we're what we're talking about with some of this is, you know the increasing move of certain core pieces of the infrastructure into a, you know, rental model um, for how these things go. And so that's fundamentally in economics. This is, and this is what I would bring in with this is the, is the economics question for, for where this goes. Um, so, so Rob, I think okay. this topic and the next topic are tied at the hip because there's, yeah. A, a fundamental question, especially we're, as we're talking about nine years out. I created a business model around creating content because I was frustrated that I couldn't get the quality of content that I wanted uh, because you couldn't pay people like us enough to create content. You know, you, you're in this circular thing. If we, if we, for the type of content we want to consume, we have to have the talents to be able to work at some of these largest, some of the largest companies in the world. And the internet has broken that model. The same thing I think is going to happen with, with cloud computing is that we fundamentally have to find a different model because, because I don't think the subscription model, quite frankly, is sustainable for the long term. I think it's a great short term trick. We, we're, an enjoy, we're enjoying it today. But that's just something that, I mean, remember when vSphere was considered to be cheap? It's not anymore. Subscri the the and, and and it is I don't think the price has really changed much. We've just we've just kind of gotten used to consolidation in the the models and we've moved on. I think over the next nine years we're going to see see the same thing with subscription. I I mean one of my concerns with Tim is talking without pricing. having been unmuted. I, no, you you're yeah, good. Tim, you're on mute. It still oh. cup follows into 2021. I'm sorry, you said vSphere was cheap. I mean, when when has anything from VMware been cheap? I mean, that's so when I was when I when I went from going when I went from buying ten thousand ten ten thousand dollar servers to buying one twenty thousand dollar server and another fifteen thousand dollars in vSphere licenses. VSphere was cheap. It saved me money at the on start of virtualization. Virtualization saved me money. It went from saving me money to just being a fixed cost that I got frustrated with. Because you, you it was actually, so yep. cheap, VMware well, completely disrupted the server hardware market and, you know, destroyed a lot of value, but then created a lot of value for customers. I mean, it's Keith, a fundamental Keith's, change. Remember Keith's it quite on, well. Keith's on to right. something pretty big, pretty big here. And especially as we're talking about 2030 is what, ha you know, what happens when let's, let's talk about low code or no code or serverless when everybody is doing this, Right when you've got the equivalent of content farms that can push out that can push out code then who are the next rob hirschfelds or keith townsends that are going to push this forward what does that what does that look like when all of this gets ridiculously commoditized but but but, but keith and, and mike mike what you just said doesn't that contradict what keith talked about that the service model will disappear because it, if it becomes commoditized, which means as a company, why do I want to invest with the infrastructure if there's services that actually do it for me and all I have to do is focus on product development and product management, that to me will explode the service market, right? That means so, that that will grow it. So Keith, I absolutely agree with you, but I, I don't think it's a conflict in statement. It is 
the who pays for it mm. changes. Like today, mm -hmm. I love the fact that I can go get a VM from AWS without buying VMware and I don't have to buy all this infrastructure. As that scale, that model breaks. Once I get to the point where I have as many VMs in my AWS cloud as I have in my data center, that model sucks. Like it is not a good price model. The But as we start to get more intelligent services, SaaS, then I start to look, oh, you know what? Instead of buying the VM, what is it that I really want? What's the business value? I don't want the VM. I want the application running on the VM. So now I, I, I put less value on the VM and more value on the service. But that has breaking our that's disrupted our market. It's disrupting VMware, it's disrupting service providers, it's disrupting uh, cloud providers, it's disrupting everyone. And that disruption is going to continue into 2030. Is there value in that disruption though? Absolutely value. The question is who, how do cloud providers, how does the people taking in the subscription dollars for this infrastructure, mm -hmm. you know, we, we, we're, I've made this argument time and time again. We are in the process of redefining infrastructure. The things that we think of as application is cold, application level stuff. At the end of the day, by 2030, it's going to be infrastructure. It's going to be stuff that no one cares about. Mm -hmm. Businesses don't care about creating applications. They care about getting the value out of the services. If they can get out, if they can get IT services without having IT, they would. And that's where they want to drive to. But that disrupts how most of us make our money. You talk about a racket. <laughs> oh, Keith, let me, but hold Man, on, maybe like, tweak, tweak what you said a little bit. <laughs> I mean, yeah. tweak, let me tweak it a little bit, Keith, because I agree with what you're saying, but I think it's, it's a little different businesses, companies don't care about IT per se, and they don't care about the applications per se. What they care about is the value they get from those applications when it comes directly to things like customer engagement, revenue growth, business operations and intelligence. That's where the value is. The application is just a means to the end and everything below it is just a means to, to the end. And you're on mute too. It's plumbing. So at the end of the day, it's plumbing. I really, well, as, as a business owner, I don't care you about. Don't care. I, I don't care about Microsoft Office. I, I don't. I, I want to send a document to Tim. I don't care if it's Office, Docs, whatever. Take your pick. I just need to send a document to Tim. So and and I, let me let me just throw out there that this is one of the foundations in which, and I'm not going to go too far on this, but. Some of us on this call know exactly what Aspect Core is about. This is our market. People do not care. We care because we can instantiate this stuff and take it out of everybody's hands. Security, observability, all these different things we think about from day zero. Going to the customer, to Keith's point and to Tim's point, they just care about the application. They, could, they care about the value they're getting from their app from their customers or their business. We care about handling all of the things they don't care about, the plumbing, the infrastructure, moving it from AWS to, to Google, to Azure, whoever, let us worry about that stuff. So, I think you, right. So, we, we, so we, in, the, in the realm of cloud 2030, do they care about cloud? And I would argue, no. They don't, they don't care. They care about the application. They don't so care where it runs from. I care. I, if I want music, I want, from 20 years ago, I want an MP3. I want a certain format. I want, if I want a document, I want a, a, something that could be read but in a CSV file. I want something that's standardized enough so that it doesn't matter. So in terms of Microsoft Word, I, it has to be something that Microsoft Word or Google Docs can read. I don't care. It has to be compatible. If it's not compatible, it doesn't matter. So basically, in terms of this, same thing is yep. that's the main thing. Well, thing we we keep we keep using we keep using the plumbing analogy, and I think the no. plumbing analogy is completely wrong. Electricity, right? Because there's electric trading behind. There's still development that happens underneath. There's hella security underneath underneath all of the infrastructure there. 
And going to what Lawrence said about standards, as we look at cl- as we look at cloud and what's happening at a macro level, and something we all need to think about for 2030, uh, is okay. Now we've got 120. I've got 220. I've got different kinds of adapters that I need all over the place that are standard but still aren't standard. Which is going to which is where which is a lot of where the cloud is headed as well. With, with a lot of the walled gardens and a lot of the ecosystems. Uh, and then, you know, and that's just from the technical side. And I'm sure Peter's probably got stuff that he could talk about on the, you know, just on the regulatory side of that as well. It's more electricity than plumbing. Plumbing, it's a pipe, it goes downhill. <laughs> so I think there's, I think there, I think getting to actually one of to, to Rob's point is and it's, it's kind of been alluded to by a couple people for, a, for a business, there is, you know, stuff that everybody needs to do, right? Everybody needs to have an email system. Everybody needs to have an expense management system. Everybody needs to have, you know, you know, the basics of running a business that all makes perfect sense to go to for most businesses to go to a SaaS for the things that are actually business critical. If you're a bank, right, you're going to you're going to keep your trading stuff. You know, that's that's the things that differentiates you from another trading house. Right. If you're a medical research group, you know, the particular algorithms and the particular applications that, you know, do your genetic sequencing are your critical IP. You're still going to want to control those means. It's a question that getting to Rob's point about, you know, Who's who who owns the means of production? It's I think it's I think it's more complicated than that. There are things that are just commodities from an application point of view and a services point of view. And then there are things that are business critical to those organizations. Right. And those are the things that smart companies should be focusing on. Right. Whether that's yeah, but, cloud or wherever. Yeah, but Don, I so I agree with you, and I, I want to underscore your comment about things are far more complicated. They're far more complicated than any of this conversation has stepped into, quite frankly. Um, so, for example, a couple of years ago, I was working with a, with a major bank, which I'm sure all of you would, would be able to relate to. Their core banking application ran on an old compact system. This is only a few years ago ran on an old compact system running Windows NT, a tower system, this is in the Bay Area, um, strapped in a rack for earthquake um, requirements, seismic requirements, but they were deathly afraid to power that system down. It was not virtualized. This was a core business, a core banking application for this major bank. Um, Why did, I'm not gonna get into the reasons why in this call, but why they were doing that, why that was continuing. There were very legitimate reasons why they had continued down that path. Nobody liked it, but it is what it is. And so unless you're willing to kind of dig in and get messy and get your hands dirty and understand everything from politics to operations to the the nature of the business, you are not going to fully appreciate or understand some of the decisions that people are making where on the surface, it's easy to kind of sit in the armchair quarterback position and say, oh, well, they should have upgraded that a long time ago. Well, okay, that's, that's easy for you to say. That's harder to do when you're living it. So again, it's just one example of the complexity. But Tim, can I, if can you, I add a if you bit? Substitute, if you substitute London for, and, and I, have a, I have another bank that is in exactly the same situation where it's, it's literally 10 year old computers running, you know, absolutely super critical infrastructure that nobody has a clue on, you know, they pray that, that, that the power doesn't go out because they have no idea how to turn them back on. But can, right. I, but can I bring this back to where you guys kind of branched off of, but bring it back to value, right? So it, it, Tim and Don, you guys talked about that, you know, Old systems upgrading, you know, where's the value? How do we, how do we extract value from this? And that, that's what businesses care about. The problem is, is that my question to everyone is, who's telling the business 
the value is in this service or in this system. I always go back to, as technologists, what is our responsibility for the monster we've created and what are we going to do about it? We've created this dependency on services because all of us used to, we all used to, we, we, you know, you're a VMware guy or you are a, you know, a Cisco guy or you are whatever that is. You're tied to those, those technologies that put money in your pocket and now you become an advocate for it. And, and we tell the business, you got to have this, you got to have this, you got to have this in order to get value. And I'm, I, I'm now wondering, have we created a monster that we now no longer can control? And we're wondering why the business is beating us up about cost and value. In other words, I mean, can we keep back to a discussion of why are we using technology? What is it for? What's its purpose? And design systems in a simplistic way to achieve that narrow goal, as opposed to getting wrapped up in the, the lore and the love of technology for technology's sake. But Keith, that genie has long since been out of the bottle. And there, I mean, that same client had 150 circuits with no documentation hmm. coming into three locations between the MPO, the MDF, and the IDF. They had no idea what, what each of those circuits were connecting to, what applications, what security ramifications um, were set up on each of them, which ones were live, which ones were dead. This goes back to organizations are running with scissors. You know, you run from one project to the next and you have limited resources. And so when something bubbles up, great, you run, you do it and you move on to the next thing because you have to. It's, and I, I don't think Why? we can continue to do that model moving forward. We've, we've kind of been able to skirt through it to this point. But I think those days are behind us and we have to think very differently. And this goes back to if we're going to be serious about how we use technology, whether it's cloud or data or um, edge, we have to change how we think about it. We talked about this in the cybersecurity session. I think it applies in each session. We have to think differently about how we approach it. And that's not a technology conversation. Right, Tim, but you said, you know, we were running with scissors and we're, we're always trying to get what we can't. I'm saying why. I, I, I almost think that, and this gets into the inequity of, of technology, I think. We, as technologists, get addicted to being the heroes. We run around with a hero complex. And I think we create this dependency or this, um, the dependency on, on legacy systems so that we can go in and save the day because we want to be seen as having value to the enterprise. Keith Townsend and I got into a debate on Twitter one time about innovation and, and the services firms don't provide innovation um, or, or specifically managed services providers. His problem with them is that they, they lack innovation and they don't focus on it. And I think what I am feeling is, is that we as technologists it, it have lost our common sense and we have stopped understanding why we got into this business in the first place. And then we cry, it's the business's fault. It's the, the leadership's fault. I'm saying it's our fault. Let's fix it. And yes, the, the genie might be out of the bottle, but if we don't do something quick, we're killing ourselves. Technologists, we're the ones with the headaches. We got bad eating habits. We got all these things. We're causing the craziness, and we and 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 so on. And 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 part of it is we realize we can make money off of it. Yeah. No, Keith, I completely agree with you. Um, but if you want to have that conversation, that's a different conversation than what we've been having, and that's not a theoretical conversation. You know, when I when I talk with other executives and fellow CIOs, which is where I spend most of my time, this is exactly the conversation that we're having is how we change the mantra of the role that technology as an organization, whether it's IT or called something else, um, plays within an organization. And it's not a technology conversation. I mean, these, these philosophical religious wars about one technology versus another, I mean, they're really pointless. Um, and this is one of the issues I have around open source is a good example. 
you have to get, you have to up level the conversation to truly understand where the value is and where the challenges are. When you start to have that conversation, which is a very hard conversation to have, the other pieces start to become clear. Start, let me underscore, triple underscore, start. Because there's a whole nother set of conversations you have to have around data, management of data, regulatory compliance, privacy, um, trust that come into play. And eventually, as you go down the path, you start to realize where you start to use things like edge and cloud and networking into the mix. All of these come together, but it's highly complicated and it starts with a different way of IT operating or whatever you want to call that, that organization, but it has to start there. So, I'll get off my soapbox. No, and I, I, love my your, I love your soapbox. And what I'm going to suggest is that we take a five minute break because it's been two hours. Just, I think that a lot of the security can be addressed by our architecture. And there's a big balance between um, performance and architecture. So if you centralize things, you could, you, you deal with, you can fix a lot of security problems, but you lose freedom. So basically a lot, it's basically, it's a lot of trade-offs. And the whole entire thing with the internet is that you lose a lot of this decentralized models is you lose a lot of performance in a lot of ways, but you gain other things. And I it's, was uh, again for for the different use cases. If you you know before talking about microservices, we used to talk about service oriented architecture. It just depends um, what portion. It's not either or. It's not decentralized versus centralized. Um, the whole workflow is spread between centralized and decentralized. Um, mm -hmm. It's just what part of the workload is running on centralized, what you've offloaded to the edge. Uh, you know, in the networking world, we call it the forwarding plane. Mm -hmm. um, but it's never been one or the other, right? We've just taken it out of the quote unquote chassis. And now we start talking about, oh, this is entirely decentralized. Uh, we have, you know, disaggregated quote unquote the network. Um, more or less, right? It was there, but it's, you know, how far are you teasing them apart, right? Um, and, this control and, and forwarding plane, this isn't a new concept in SDN. This was an old, old uh, Cat6 case, right? There was this notion of a MIB and a FIB. We knew this, but, you know, it's, it's just taking it out of um, not just centralized control planes, centralized vendors, right? That's that's what disaggregating of the network itself lets you do. And then, it's not solely the premise of, say, Cisco now anymore and um, so in when terms you start of talking that, about disaggregated networks. In terms uh, of like uh, basically having things having to be connected, you need the data to be for, the, for an application to work to, or to be complete. You need the data to be connected what type of data do you need to be connected? What type of um, and what what type of communications do you need to be? And what do you need to? Uh, I think they were talking about have a have something work but be degraded. And how do you, how could you rebuild somewhat quickly? What's the core part that you want to um, be the foundation for the for a rebuild? So basically, um, what's the core part? What's the essential um, building block uh, or unit of analysis that you care about um, for um, for building a for a society for an economy for um, for regulating let's say security for regulating um, freedom for business whatever it is for deciding what you need to be able to have a do rebuild on. If, if you're trying to uh, rebuild uh, an application from scratch because there's a security breach, what's where do you want to start from? You can't rebuild everything, but what do you need? And so in that regard, what do you need to be able to have? Uh, what do you need to be able to build up in terms of like a safe mode, in terms of what needs to be connected, what needs to be communicating with immediately? Those are questions in terms of cloud 2030 that we, I care about. Is that too much, in, too much jibber jabber? No, no. 
Oh, sometimes, sometimes I just have words coming out of my mouth. So, Lawrence, um, I would say that um, to answer part of your question, I think uh, one of the uh, one of the things that solves some problems mm -hmm. is coming up with a common way of communicating between different services that have specific functions. Um, the way that we've settled on lately has been APIs. Mm -hmm. um, you, generally, the APIs represent some kind of function, and usually, in the the in the um, when API you're communicating with an API, the the API actually tells you what its capabilities are. Um, but uh, so, um, but there's there's other ways of um, uh, solving some of the problems. But I guess in a general sense, what I'm trying to say is that. Um, there needs to be boundaries of the uh, of, uh, discrete functions of what they can do and what they can't do. Um, and that pretty much solves a lot of the problems because it allows us to have um, uh, basically dynamics. You know, we can change on the fly because any perfectly built system will be broken almost immediately. There is no such thing as something that can be, you know, the the solution to all problems because there's people involved and we break shit all the time. So, so um, it's composable. It's good. Yeah. And it's it, to a certain extent that to kind of toot our own horn a little bit, Rob and I, and some others on this call, that's why OpenStack um, as, uh, mm -hmm. as an organization um, was so successful um, because uh, we came up with something that was fundamentally a bunch of different people working on different problems that were very discreet, very purpose built to a certain extent, not all of them, but most of them, the successful pieces. And they fundamentally did one or two, uh, you know, a few discrete things and they communicated over APIs so that the groups that were developing these, pro uh, these projects that became products um, were discrete and they could develop independently. Um, uh, now, fundamentally, that doesn't um, always, well, I should say that allowed us to do our own thing and to develop um, pro products that could be uh, bought in uh, by customers um, basically over a, a few years. Um, I think OpenStack became kind of viable over about, uh, I guess, about three to four years it became viable. Uh, some products started pumping out that were actually commercially viable. So that was, that was pretty, pretty revolutionary. I don't think too many organizations have been, have been capable of getting so many people together and doing something like that. And I think to a certain extent, it was because we didn't bake in a specific way of how the projects were going to work and how they were going to be developed. And, um, and we just, we as an organization put together um, some generalities of tools and um, what we're generally trying to accomplish, and people just went out and did stuff, and it and and it's still going strong today. So I don't know if that's too soapboxy, happy talk, but um, I think fundamentally that's have, building something that's, that can dynamically respond to changes and build new products um, and allow people to be um, to come up with new ideas. That's that's how that's how this works. Or that's how we, that's how we can be successful in the 2030. I, I was going to say that was pretty brave to speak up about OpenStack, but what? yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure Sean and I see eye to eye on, on some of those. those yeah, I was um, going to say this sounds like Kubernetes at this, at this point. Um, well, but but so I but you're, you're it is originally why I got involved is because of containers um, yeah. and you know it became v, uh, VMs but originally when I was at Yahoo we were actually building our own container tools and that's why we got involved but anyway it, that was, no, that this, was this, is, this is this to me is the topic right the the topic to to bring us back to where we were with subscriptions and and things like that is we are very captivated by the pace of innovation. And we, we have a huge need to move quickly and build things quickly, right? I mean, the, your comment about, hey, we built something really fast with OpenStack, um, in part because we separated out the teams and everybody was able to do their own thing. Um, one of the, my 
frustrations with OpenStack, and you were involved in this too, is there's no product product management. There was minimal architectural coordination to build a product. Oh, they um, agree. From from that perspective, but I don't. I think OpenStack was written by the architecture that um, the the project architecture was very similar to what we see being written large all over the place. Hey, I need, I need to do something. I'm not gonna write it myself. I'm gonna go use this SAS and that SAS and that SAS. And in the last section, we talked about, you know, a, a 10 year old tower PC that's running banking infrastructure. And while we're all looking at it horrified, there's a part of me that's like, hell yeah, they got, that's robust. If you had done that with a SAS, there is no way in hell that your SaaS application would be ten could could run ten years or even ten months without you know some some ability of, of risk on what the SaaS provider is going to do or how the SaaS provider is going to manage that service. I can't even get half of my apps to run on my old iPad that's a year old. I hope you enjoyed this session. Uh, in this one, we we covered a lot of interesting ground about the economics. And that feeds into pace of innovation and then ultimately scale. And those are the next se sessions up in our Cloud 2030 Summit. Uh, tune in for that one. It, it's really important about how we continue to innovate and what's going to happen as we keep stepping on the gas and making innovation faster and faster and bigger and bigger. Enjoy it.